Hello, I'm Hannah, I'm Scribe Support Accountant, and this is the second of three videos covering the initial setup and training on Scribe. This one looks at data entry and bank reconciliations. So all the data entry, day-to-day -day running of Scribe will take place mostly within the transaction menu here. So firstly, we come to payments. When we click into the payment screen, all the previously ended payments are listed with the most recent one showing at the top. Okay, this list can be sorted by any of these headings simply by clicking on it. You've also got a search all columns on the far right hand side if you wanted to look for something in particular. It's free search so you can type names, numbers, etc. in here in order to find things and then filter in the information here. To add a new payment, you simply click add payment up on the top right hand side. It's fairly self-explanatory, but we'll go through the process of adding one in here. So firstly, it's a case of selecting the tender type. So we can have check in here, online payment, which relates to anything such as card, direct debit, backs, etc. There's also an option for petty cash, if you do have petty cash at your council, which removes the option to select a bank because it's just deemed as cash related only. Okay, so in this example, I'm going to say I'm making an online payment. It's then a case of selecting the relevant bank account that the payment is coming from, all your bank accounts will be listed in the drop down. And in this example, I've selected the current account. Then it's a case of entering the date, so the date that the payment has been made. We've got descriptions and suppliers here. So as you may remember when I was talking in video one about the setup, if you've previously entered the description or the supplier, they will appear in the drop downs to select. But if you want to enter either a new description and or a new supplier, you can do so by simply typing them in the boxes on the right hand side. So in this example, I'm going to enter previously enter description for grass cutting against a supplier that I've used previously. So it appears in the list. Then it's just a case of selecting the cost center. And once you've selected a cost center, it will filter just to the cost codes to select against it. So I'm going to allocate that to my grounds maintenance cost center with the cost code below of grass cutting. If it's a section 137 payment, you can tick the box and then there's a report that can be run on that with that flag selected. And at the bottom, you can add some additional notes if you want to have a bit more information against the transaction record here. Top right hand side allows you to enter a check number or if you've made an online payment, you may have a reference number that you want to add in. You've got an option to add a minute reference if the pay payment was agreed at a meeting and you want to reference that. You can have an invoice number from the supplier. You can have an invoice date from the supplier as well. And then there's all the VAT types as you'd expect them to appear in the list. So if we select standard, for example, and we enter the figure in, it'll calculate the 20%. If you do find that the VAT differs slightly, you can amend it as you need to, to get to the correct total. And then it's just a case of clicking add. It'll therefore take an next available number and now appear in the top of the list. If you want to go back into any of the entries that are listed in here, you can do so by clicking on the blue date highlighted here, which will load the page back up and you can make amendments. So if you are VAT registered and submitting VAT returns via Making Tax Digital, once you've submitted VAT returns, the transactions related to that VAT return will be locked down and you won't be able to edit them. Other than that, you would be able to edit. So if you're not VAT registered and not using Making Tax Digital, you'd be able to edit transactions at any point. Obviously, if you just want to come and add descriptive elements, not a problem here, but do just be mindful of the fact that if you came and amended values or coding, you would potentially corrupt some of your figures. Okay, but if it's just that you've just put it on and realise you've made a mistake, then it's absolutely fine to come and edit it and just save it to update it. When we put that payment on, you may have noticed that we only had the option to apply it to one code. If you have instances where you have payments or invoices that relate to more than one code, you may want to use the split record option. This would mean you'd need to put the original invoice payment on to the full value just to one single code. Under the more option on the right hand side you can select to split record which will open up this screen and this allows you to split out the value that you've allocated against the transaction. So in this example I've got £56 net value against grass cutting but if actually some of the work done related to work at the allotment for example I can split that out providing I have full value allocated out, nothing left unallocated, as you can see at the moment something in red, so I need to make sure I allocate that out. 
provided I do that and I've got nothing left unallocated, it will allow me to update it. So what I'll find now is I have now two transactions related to the same payment to the supplier, but because they relate to different codes, there's two voucher numbers. So this will happen. And then when you then come to reconcile the bank, you'll just need to remember that you'll have one entry on the bank statement that may then relate to multiple entries on Describe. In terms of deleting payments or receipt transactions, it's not possible to do this on Scribe because it would leave a gap in the voucher number. So if you have an instance where you want to remove a transaction that you've entered, you don't want it to show anymore, it would just be a case of simply zeroing it out. To go back into it, simply update the values of zeros in here and just add a note to say, or whatever the reason is, and then put an answer in there, for example, whatever it is, and just save it to update. So you won't have a gap in the voucher sequence, but it effectively removes any values from showing in the, in the reports. So that deals with payments. I'll just mention receipts that really just say they work in a very, very similar way. When you come into the receipt screen, they're all listed here, as you can see, with the most recent one at the top. Again, you click add receipt to put a receipt on. All the same fields that we've just looked at, except you're adding money coming in as opposed to money going out. So next we come to in the list, regular payments and regular receipts. The idea behind these is that anything that you have happening regularly, monthly, quarterly, any level of regularity you can use it for, you can set them up in these window options and then you can apply them to save a bit of time saving so you don't have to keep entering the same information each time. So we're in the regular payment screen here and I've got a couple set up, one set up for the clerk salary and another one for my electricity direct debit. So whilst they're in this screen, they're not going to feature in part of the accounts until I'm ready to apply them, i.e. I'm ready to create them as a payment. So to add one, you just click add regular payment up on the top right hand corner. If I go into one I've already put on, so the clerk Sally, for example, very similar to the payment screen we just looked at in terms of needing to put description, supplier, coding, values, etc. So as I said, when it's listed here, it's not going to feature in the accounts until I'm ready to apply it. So I need to apply up here to create a payment, set the date. So if today was the day the clerk salary was going to go through, then I could tick the box, the relevant one, click apply, and it'll feed the information through. So if I go back to the payment screen here, my most recent payment is now the clerk salary. So it's created that record for me. And if I go back to regular payments, it's still there. So next month or next time that I might need it, it's there for me to put through. So it saves me having to keep entering the same data in. So as I said, it works on every, any level of regularity and it also works even if the values are changing. So for example, if my electricity direct debit changed on a month by month basis, then I could simply apply it and edit the value each month. So that's regular payments. There's regular receipts as well. So it works in the same way that you'd set them up and then every time you receive some, the income, you could then apply it but it tends to be less common that regular receipts is used. It's much more often that I see regular payments set up. So that deals with that. So next we're going to look at purchase orders and sales invoices. So Scribe has the facility to raise both of these on here and then order that you can provide an invoice to give out to your customers or an order to give out to your suppliers. I'll use sales invoices as the example because that tends to be more commonly done, but purchase orders work in a very similar way, just in reverse, which I'll mention a little bit more at the end. So when we click into the sales invoice screen, all the sales invoices previously entered are listed, as you can see, with the most recent one at the top. This time they do have a status, so we can see what's happening with them. All these ones are paid, but if we raise a new one and it wasn't yet paid, it would show as outstanding in the list. So we'll go and add a new one, which is done again by clicking add sales invoice up on the top right hand corner. So very similar to what we've just added in, but we'll go through the process again so you can see how to go through it. So initially, it's wanting you to add a tender type and a bank account that the payment's going to be made into. So at this point, this will be your best guess as to how you expect your customer to pay. If it's different when they actually do receive payment, then you can come and amend it. So I'm going to assume that I will receive an online payment into the current account when my customer pays me for this invoice. And as I said, if that's not the case when it happens, then I can simply amend the record at that point. So then we can add in an invoice date. We can have a due date. So I'm going to give them to the end of the month in this example to, raise, to settle the invoice. 
So again, previously entered descriptions and customers are listed, so it can be simply just a case of selecting them from the list. Or again, if you want a new description or a new customer, you can select you add them in and here. So I'm going to charge for allotment fees and select a customer from my list. Again, you'd allocate a cost center and a cost code. So this time it's going to go to income and I have a cost code of allotment fees here. At the bottom, I've got an option to print notes. So if you want to give some more details to show on the invoice, these will print on the invoice. So if you want to break down your description a little bit further, you can do. So top right would be the check number. If they pay, pay by check, you, know, you can add this in at the point of the payment being received. So you can choose the VAT type. So I'm, going to say I'm not VAT registered in this example. Now I have an option to add some item details in here. So this will break down the information I'm charging for. So I've got a description on the left hand side, so allotment fees in this case, but I can break it down. So this might be relevant if you were charging for haul hire and you wanted to list out the multiple dates that the invoice made up. So in this example, if I say that we have a couple of plots in here and I can charge for them both, so you can see how that will work. So I've got this one and I've got another one, so say they're both £20 and therefore. It will come to the bottom, so I've got £40 to charge my customer. And here, down on the bottom right, you can see I've got some footer text, and every invoice I raise will show this footer text, and I'll show you shortly where you can add that information in. So when I click Add, down at the bottom, it will create the invoice for me, as we have here. So it's pulling through my parish council name and address, as entered in the council profile that I covered in video number one. I'll also show you shortly where you can add in a logo if you've got one so that the logo appears on the invoice. So we've got our customer and because there's full address is on the setup menu then it's appearing on here. Invoices on Scribe start at number one within the financial year and then simply count up. So I'm at number 65 in this example. We've got my invoice date, when it's due, and then we've got the details of what we're charging for. So as we said, we've got the description here, which is then broken down into the different elements that I'm charging for. And at the bottom, I've got some payment details here as part of my footer text. So once we've raised this invoice, we can choose to print it out. So top right up here, we've got a print icon. So we could print the invoice out and then post out, give it out to our customer. Or we could choose to download it up here on the top left and then put it into PDF if you wanted to email it out. Okay, so if we return to the list now, uh, you can see that invoice is now top of the list because it's the most recent invoice we have raised. And you see it's also outstanding. So we've not received payment yet and therefore it's showing as outstanding in the list. In terms of the way Scribe works, Scribe works on a receipts and payments basis based on the actuals at the point at which they're received or which they're paid out. So whilst this invoice is outstanding, i.e. not paid, it won't feature in the accounts at all. All the only place we'll see it in is this list until at which point we receive payment. So when we do receive our money and we have a Mr. Jones comes along and pays us our £40, at that point we can then convert this to a receipt transaction, i.e. we've received the money and therefore we want to see it in the accounts. So to do that, on the far right hand side under this more option is an option to convert to receipt. We simply select that and it takes the information at the end when we raise the invoice and feeds it into the next available receipt number. The idea being that because you've put the information on when you raise the invoice, you then don't want to have to repeat yourself when you're then entering the receipt transaction, it will feed it through. It also retains the link. So as you can see, it's now receipt number 68, but we can see that it came from invoice number 65. And if I wanted to view that invoice, I could simply click that and it would load back up for me. If I return to the sales invoice, screen here you can now see because it's converted to receipt it's updated as paid we can go back into the information it won't allow us to edit it in this screen because it's been converted so any edits would need to be made in the receipt screen but it does retain the link here again so we can see that it became receipt number 68 and we can move through if we wanted to by clicking on that button in terms of adding in a logo and any footer text that's done right at the bottom down here under account this is may you may remember where you came in right at the beginning and changed your password and you've also got this in this option to customize invoice here so this is where you can add a logo so the logo will show on both invoices and orders so that's both the same in here it's set to be fairly rectangular inside that it likes so if you have a circular logo or a longer logo once you've uploaded it if you find when you raise your first invoice or order that it looks a bit stretched a bit weird just let us know and we can fix it for you You've also got an option to add the footer text in here. So once you've put that in, every subsequent invoice that you raised will then show that information on the invoice. 
Okay, so that deals with sales invoices. I will just mention purchase orders in here, but it works very, very similarly. When you see you've come in here, all the previously orders entered are listed with the most recent one at the top. You'd add one up here on the top right. The process is exactly the same. You'd raise the order, you'd send it out to your supplier, wait for the goods or services to be provided. Once that happens and you make the payment, you then convert it as well. But obviously an order would be converted to a payment and then featuring the accounts. And as we looked at, sales invoices are converted to receipts. Okay, so that deals with transaction entry. So this is all the bits and bobs that you'll do in order to add the data on Describe. And now the second bit of this video is to look at the bank menu and the reconciliations. So if we can open up the bank menu, the first thing that we come to in here is bank transfer. So this is where you can come and add in details of any bank transfers and movement between bank accounts. It's also relevant if you have a petty cash account and you're replenishing that. So you're spending from the petty cash account and then you move money from another account to replenish it. Even if you're doing that via a check, it doesn't need to be entered as a payment and receipt situation because it's just still moving money between bank accounts, in essence, money between the council. To add one in, really simple, you click add transfer here and it would simply be a case of adding in the date of the transfer, the bank is coming from, the bank is going to, the value of that transfer and a comment so that you recognise what it is. And what you'll then find is it will appear in the reconciliation screen to tick off when you see it going in or out of the relevant bank statement. Okay. That is done in reconcile. So this reconcile option here that we're now into is where you'll come to reconcile your bank statement. So you'll have your physical copy of your bank statement in front of you ready to tick the items off as you see them appearing. So the first thing to do is set the bank account that you're reconciling to, so the statement that you've got the bank for. So in this example, we are going to reconcile the current account, and then it's a case of setting the cash date. So I would always recommend that you use a month end date here, if possible, if your statements come on a monthly basis to the end of the month, then that would I, I'd recommend. So in this example, I'm going to say that I am going to do my February reconciliation, Okay, if you receive statements that fall at different times of the month, say mid-month, for example, you could just use the mid-month date to keep it in line with the statement. Obviously, you'll just have to make an adjustment once you get to year end because you're going to need to do a reconciliation to the 31st of March. Okay, so once you've selected the cash date, everything that you're now going to tick in here will have that same cash date. So in this example, everything that appears on my February statement will have a February cash date of the 29th. So the end of the month, so that's fine for everything that's gone through, regardless of what date within February that it went out on the statement. What you'll then find is that all the payments and the receipts that are listed on Scribe that as of yet haven't been matched off to the bank, i.e. are still uncashed, will be listed here. And it will just be a case of you having your statement in front of you and working through on here and simply ticking the boxes as you see the items going out. And working through so you can use the headings here to sort them and you've also got a search option as well if you've got quite a lot of information in here that you need to work through you can do all of that so it's just a case of ticking all the items as, as we have here once you've done that you would just click save at the top and it will give you this little summary of what you should expect to see the bank statement matching to so all being well you can keep a copy of that if you want to so just open and view the report so it's fairly brief here but you can keep a copy of that that you can then file with the statement and as I was talking about with regards to invoicing earlier all reports in Scribe can be printed either using the print icon on the right hand side or you could download it and just keep a pdf copy of it okay so this reconciliation process that we just looked at you would then repeat for any other bank accounts that you've got so in an ideal world you'll do this reconciliation process on a monthly basis for each of your bank so once you've completed your individual reconciliation for each of your statements, we can then look at reconcile all banks. There's two points to reconcile all banks. Firstly, is to bring all your bank reconciliations individually for your individual accounts together so you can check the overall balance on Scribe. And secondly, it enables you to get a full bank rec report, which you can take along to council meetings and get formally signed off if you want to. So this first page, within Reconcile All Banks is where you need to put information in so that in order that it can run the report for you. So we need to set the audit date. So that will tend to be the month end date that you've just reconciled to. So in theory, on the Reconcile screen, I did my statement reconciliation for the end of February, and therefore I'm setting that as my same audit date. 
You'll then find all your bank accounts will be listed in here. Petty cash will show at the bottom and it's just a case of updating the statement dates. So all of mine are showing us at the end of February and adding in the statement amounts at that point. So these were the statement figures I had at these dates. If you don't have any petty cash, then this will show a zero and you can just leave it as that there. You'll then work through here and choose to do the summary report, which will look like this. So at the top, it produces with a prepared and approved by statement. So if you did want to take it and formally get it signed off, you can do. And then as you can see, we've got this bank reconciliation. So it's running it to the date that we've requested. So the audit date is the date that it will run to. Then we've got the cash in hand figure. So this bank reconciliation will always be cumulative from the 1st of April. So we'll always see this cash in hand as at the 1st of April showing. It will then add on all the receipts for the time period that we've requested. So in this example, everything that we've added on up until the end of February. It will then subtract all the payments for the same time period to give us our current cash in hand figure as at that date. So this is section A. Section B at the bottom is the bank statement. So it takes what we've entered as per what was on the bank statements. It adjusts for anything unpresented. So I, what we didn't tick off at that point will be adjusted for to give us B, our adjusted bank balance. And what we're looking for is that A equals B and it says it checks out OK, i.e. what we've recorded on Scribe matches off to the bank statements once adjusted for anything unpresented. OK, if it doesn't balance, it will give you an error of what it's out by and then it would be a case of finding out what's happened with it. I go over looking for errors a little bit more in um, video three which looks at how to find them in the bank reports if you do have any troubles with reconciling the bank. So that takes us to the end of looking at data entry and bank reconciliations. Please now view my third video which looks at VAT and reporting.